Hello and welcome to Conversations with Dr. Bachner. And it's a real, real treat today. I'm joined by Saumia Swamithan. Swa- Swa- Sorry, Saumia. People know I'm terrible on names. I apologize. Who has a remarkable position. She's, um, she is a scientific director for the World Health Organization, and she's currently in India. Saumia, welcome. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you very much, Howard. It's a real pleasure. So, Saumia, like me, you're a pediatrician. Um, so, uh, you've, you've been at the World Organization for about five years. You've had two positions. Um, you're chief scientific officer now. What did you do before you came to the World Health Organization, Saumia? So I was a researcher in India. I worked at the uh, Indian Council of Medical Research, which is sort of the equivalent of the NIH in India. And the ICMR has both intramural and extramural institutes. So I worked for about 25 years in one of the intramural institutes, the Tuberculosis Research Center, which is actually based in Chennai. And then in 2015, I was appointed the head of the Indian Council of Medical Research, the director general. And I held that position till 2017 when I then went and joined Dr. Tedros uh, soon after he became the director general uh, at the World Health Organization, initially as his deputy director general. And then last year, we had a reorganization of what we call a transformation of the organization. And this new science division was created. And he offered me the position of the first chief scientist of the World Health Organization, which I, of course, very happily accepted. Congratulations. Think, uh, Sa- Samia, before we get in- into the World Health Organization role in the pandemic, which is, is what will be the focus of our conversation, you, you know, I don't, I don't think many people know how the World Health Organization is organized. Um, and could you say a few words about that? I mean, um, the home base is in Geneva, but, but, yes. could you, but could you talk about in general how it's organized? Sure. So the World Health Organization was formed in 1948. Um, It's headquartered in Geneva. It's made up basically of the member states. So we have 194 countries that we call member states that come together and uh, basically are the organization. And we call ourselves really the secretariat. And the way it works is there's a headquarters in Geneva where we have about 2,500 or so staff and much of the normative work of the organization is done at headquarters. We then have six regional offices, right. including one in uh, Washington, D.C., the Pan-American Health Organization, uh, the Southeast Asian region, Western Pacific, Eastern Mediterranean, European and African region. So there are six regional offices and six regional directors who are actually elected by those countries of, of the region. So the director general as well as the regional directors are elected. And then you have, uh, we have country offices in about 150 or so countries where you have the head of the country office and then the staff and the, and the size of these offices can vary from, you know, five people in some of the more developed countries to over, you know, 500 people in conflict uh, driven or other uh, countries which have a lot of health problems where WHO is more operational. So, Mia, how, how, how does the World Health Organization relate to Gavi or UNICEF, the other big players in, in global health? So that's a great uh, question, because obviously, I think when the World Health Organization was set up in 1948, it was the only global health organization. And it has in its uh, constitution, you know, several functions um, and it had, as in fact, its mission and vision early on, the, the health for all principle, the delivery of health for all people, regardless of where they live in the world. So that's very much enshrined in, in the philosophy of the organization. And um, research is, is part of it, but so is guidelines, standards, data, and working with countries. Uh, and then more recently, the international health regulations, which directly deal with surveillance and response to outbreaks. Um, UNICEF is another UN organization, obviously, that deals with children's health and education. We work very closely on many areas, including immunization and children and adolescents' health, as well as some of the other UN agencies like UNFPA 
on sexual and reproductive health uh, violence against women with the food and agricultural organization on issues related to food safety and zoonosis antimicrobial resistance and so on so we have these relationships with um, many or most of the un organizations and then there are uh, organizations like gavi the the vaccine alliance um, and and the alliance is really gavi who and unicef which together form the the uh, alliance and which are responsible really for for distributing uh, millions and millions of uh, vaccines to children in the developing world mostly in the lower middle income countries and over the last 15 years or so has really resulted in a huge increase both in routine immunization of already existing older vaccines but also in introduction of newer vaccines like the pneumococcal vaccine rota and hpv and, and so on last year actually we launched a program called the uh, the global action plan for sustainable development goals where who and 12 other agencies came together and said we need to work together if we have to achieve the sdgs both um, not just at the global level but also down at the country level you know much more effective coordination and delivery of services less duplication more efficiency and the idea was to accelerate the achievement of the uh, sustainable development goals by 2030 who who creates this, uh, the sustainable development goals so again it was created by the the countries of the world coming together at the united nations and then you know you had the millennium development right, goals which yeah, ran right. from 2000 to 2015 and then 2016 to 2030 are the sustainable development uh, goals and of course sdg3 is all about health but there are other goals you know on gender equality on water sanitation on the environment many of which are of course very closely related to health and uh, so who is a lead agency responsible for uh, sdg3 and so when we uh, when dr tedros took over as a director general we launched a new five year strategic plan that was very aligned to achieving the sdgs and that was divided into three pillars the first pillar being universal health coverage right. achieving that because we've been saying that for a long time mm. but we really want to achieve it by 2030 the second pillar is in fact devoted to health emergencies and it's about prevention detection and response and we've seen now clearly how many countries have been hit so hard and have found it difficult to respond to this pandemic so the second pillar is really about those building those capacities and those functions and uh, and we we say there are two sides of the coin universal health coverage and health protection against health emergencies go together and the third pillar is very interesting because it's to do with uh, healthy well-being so it's not to do with disease but really it's to do with well-being so it's it's to do with all of those risk factors and determinants of disease like the social and environmental determinants which have a huge impact on health but which are not in the mandate of the health ministry so a good example is road safety for example we know millions of people die you know due to road traffic accidents every year uh, but the health ministry is not in charge so it's but it's a health ministry's role to be a steward and to be an advocate for for road safety so that uh, less people you know get injured and die similarly you know it's water sanitation it's nutrition right. it's things like air pollution which again is a major killer today in the world and uh, and where you have to work with other ministries like environment and food and agriculture so that's the third pillar it's all about well being and so we have geared ourselves up really to deliver in in all the three uh, of course last 6 months we everybody's been working flat out on um, on the corona virus pandemic um but we are also very focused on measuring results and and focused on on delivery but we we have to do this with our partners and our major partners are the ministries of health they are the ones who implement in the countries and who works with them in 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 many different ways now Samia, the world changed in December and January, January of this year. The world fundamentally changed. We, we, we've had pandemics before, but I think 
I've, I've come to think of it as the great pandemic of 2020. It's just easier for me to think of it that way. So the great pandemic of 2020. Uh, uh, did Dr. Tedros call you or did you call Dr. Tedros and say, we have a problem? There's a, there's a big issue. When did you first, first know that, that this was going to fundamentally change the world? So it was actually the WHO office in China that uh, picked up the news of these atypical pneumonias in Wuhan and uh, got in touch with the headquarters. And uh, our emergencies program, which was actually completely revamped after the 2014-15 Ebola outbreak, mm. and which is a very strong uh, program now, they have they deal with a network of the international health regulation focal points. So there are national focal points in every country who work with the WHO on anything to do with the international health regulations. And so they were actually uh, alerted, you know, very early in January. And, uh, and then, of course, the WHO worked with the Chinese government and they, they confirmed very soon within 24 hours that this was going on. So really on the 31st of December, the 1st of January, right. we knew that there was something serious happening. And from then on, it's been a nonstop, you know, dialogue and interaction with the uh, authorities in China, uh, up with our China office, obviously there, but then also interacting with all of these uh, IHR national focal points. I think they first met on the 4th of January. So the alert was sent out to all countries on that day that something very unusual was going on that would need to be watched. And from then on, it's been a daily affair of learning more, finding out, sharing uh, the knowledge with, with everyone. And, uh, and then, of course, we started doing the press briefings also fairly early on. And that's been, that's, we've kept that up over the last six months to make sure that we inform the world as soon as we have anything new um, so this, it was happening daily, I think, till the month of July, and then it's now gone to uh, twice a week. So, so Mia, w um, when did you have a sense or the WHO have a sense that this was not going to be confined to Wuhan and that this was going to be a world problem? So, again, because of our experience with the previous outbreaks of other coronaviruses like SARS, and MERS, um, our um, technical experts within uh, the WHO who's, who worked on coronaviruses for a long time actually used that knowledge to make some predictions, including the fact that there could be human to human transmission mm -hmm. and that it was very possible that this virus could travel you know, through people uh, and, and go to other parts of China as well as to other countries. So I think by the middle of January or so, it was clear, and of course there were also reports coming in from um, other countries of, uh, of travelers from Wuhan who were being reported uh, to be sick. Uh, the one thing I think that helped initially was the um, sequencing of the virus yeah. by Chinese scientists. Right. And the fact that they put it out in this public database yeah. they say it on the 11th of january so that right several things happened diagnostics were almost within 48 hours right. there were diagnostic tests that were available the second thing is everybody knew what this uh, virus was and uh, and could start working on things even like vaccines for example based on the whole genome sequence data so i think that's been a big difference this time around of course we didn't know a lot of things about the virus at that point you know, about asymptomatic people, uh, that there could be such large numbers of asymptomatic people that they could transmit it, that it could be transmitted before people had symptoms uh, in the pre-symptomatic stage. Uh, and then the various modes of, you know, how, when and where this virus transmits, I think we've learned a lot over the last couple of months. But I think the basic principles of a respiratory viral outbreak and, and how this could turn into a much more serious uh, global pandemic that alarm was was launched and of course we officially uh, called it a public health emergency of international concern on the 30th of january you know we have a, a an emergency committee that meets that's called to meet 
and advise on these kind of things, infectious disease outbreaks to the director general. So they met on the 22nd and 23rd of January. And at that point, they did not think that it constituted a public health emergency of international concern because it was still very limited at that point. And even on the 30th of January, I think there was something like 82 cases outside of China and no deaths had been reported outside China. But at that point, there were enough countries that had reported cases and so it was called public health emergency. So that was on the 30th of January, uh, 2020. When the WHO declares a public health emergency, um, um, do countries react in a particular way? I, I, I mean, what, 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 what's the ramifications of uh, the WHO making that type of announcement? Yes, so when the WHO makes that announcement, it's basically alerting all countries um, to this uh, disease and the fact that it could be a risk to them and that they need to ramp up whatever the systems, which you know are already all laid out in the international health regulations uh, about uh, you know surveillance putting in place surveillance making sure that you have the laboratory capacity and the diagnostic capacity making sure that you have your um, public health measures in place for uh, isolating cases for for contact tracing for quarantining uh, the contacts and of course making sure that you also are able to take care of patients who get sick and so your own hospital capacity and, and everything that you need, uh, oxygen, uh, you know, other drugs to take care of people, uh, to provide standard of care, ventilation, of course. And then in the month of February, you know, we, we saw very early on that there was a complete collapse of global supply chains for many of these essential items, including personal protective equipment for healthcare workers. And sadly, we've seen huge numbers of healthcare workers. I yeah. think 10% of all infections are among healthcare workers. Oxygen, ventilators, you know, uh, many of these things were in, were in short supply and it took a while to, to sort out. So WHO actually then started procuring and dispatching diagnostic kits to countries. You know, in Africa and the whole continent of Africa, there were only two countries that had the RT-PCR capacity at the beginning, uh, in early February, Senegal and South Africa. And within a matter of three weeks, WHO trained people in all the other countries in Africa, made sure that there was a, at least one lab in each country that could perform these tests and shipped kits over uh, there so that they could start testing. You know, And of course, then over the last few months, the testing capacity has increased, but in many countries still in Africa, there are not as many labs uh, as they should be. But what is good is that there's been a lot of also innovations in diagnostics uh, so that we now have different kinds of tests that are becoming available and hopefully we'll have a high sensitive, high specificity uh, antigen detection test which would make life a lot, lot easier, especially for remote areas. What do you think um it was, I was going to ask you what, what was January and February like, and you've just said what January and February like that was perfect. Um, what were the the really early challenges, Samia? When you when you look back, it may feel like it's a decade ago now, um, but but when you look back to February and March, you know um, you're you're watching what evolves uh, in China uh, that. They're extraordinary in, you know, circling the wagons around 50 or 55 million people. It's just extraordinary. I mean, they've had very little disease in uh, the centers of Beijing or Shanghai, uh, uh, or, or Shanghai. They've had some, but not, not much. And then, uh, obviously, the focal point in Europe becomes Italy. Uh, you know, I do a live stream with Mauricio Sacconi, who says, you have no idea what, what's going to happen. It's been seen well over a million times. And I think it alerts the rest of Europe and the U.S. to this is a pandemic of just epic proportions. So when you think about March and April, what's what's the role for the WHO? Is it really to focus on low and middle income countries or, or just enhance communication? What really is the role in March and April? What are the great challenges? Sure. No, there were uh, many challenges, and I think the biggest one was staying ahead of 
the the science or at least staying trying to stay updated with the evolving science and um, you know you've seen this uh, the the um, the output scientific output has been amazing initially yeah. of course from china and we have to be really grateful to those chinese doctors and scientists who took the time to write all those papers in the midst of what they were going through we we really try you know got a lot of information about both the clinical and the epidemiological uh, features of of this disease and and it it was a things that other countries then used um and then we late february early march you know started in italy in europe and then started flaring up in in other countries and you saw this huge impact particularly on the elderly you know hospitals getting flooded you know healthcare workers really being burnt out and so on and then we started seeing this mortality going up um and at the same time you know the health system was then focused really on taking care of the sick but we knew that in order to do the the basic public health measures you need to go out there and do the painstaking work of uh, of tracking and tracing and quarantining people which really requires a lot of workforce and i think that was one of the gaps even in the high income countries it was it was lacking certainly has been uh, in the us it still is in the us in many countries it's a challenge and i know that now people are being recruited in many of these countries to right. take on that function the other challenge as i mentioned was the shortage of supplies of all kinds of supplies diagnostics ppes oxygen ventilators and so on and that that's one area we worked with our un partners to set up a consortium that could do this uh, take care of the supplies uh, and the supply chain so on the science we decided early on that that research is going to be important that science is going to play a very major role here being a new virus and so we convened um, scientists researchers in early february to uh, to debate on what we know what we don't know and we came out with a research road map and and that then led, led to the formation of about nine working groups that were you know like on animal uh, reservoirs and and zoonotic uh, transmission another one on on diagnosis and, and on the virology another one on epidemiology and we launched several protocols core protocols and we call them the solidarity protocols right. so there was one on zero epidemiological studies that right. countries could use um on di- on uh, therapeutics on vaccines on infection prevention and control so these working groups were all made up of international experts from all around the world right so not They just who so i just not who yeah. employees this is a, a collaboration yes. between the who and scientists around the world okay. yes so that's one thing which is very important is that everything who produces is actually done through our expert advisory committees so it's not just the who staff who sit and write guidelines i think this is very important and um, the new science division that i had in fact one of our departments is on the quality assurance of norms and standards and one of the things we are trying to do is to really uh, make sure that the evidence base on which we do our guidelines is is absolutely exemplary that the way we do our guidelines is more digital 21st century you know forward looking that it's updated more frequently and things like that so our expert advisory groups and all of these groups of experts have been debating and coming out with these guidelines that we've been you know uh, putting out from time to time and we update them whenever there's new knowledge that's available so it's been an incredible experience to work with these people and we brought them together again in July and 1300 people attended this time because it was virtual and we had it over two days and we had it in two sections what are the lessons that we've learned what do we now know about this virus and where are the big gaps and where is the research needed and what kind of research questions so let's have another uh, research prioritization exercise and we discovered you need interdisciplinary research in many areas like transmission for example you know you need the engineers to work with the virologists and the epidemiologists to really figure out where does transmission most occur when does it occur what kind of patients and and of course what are the public health interventions that are most effective so samia so at the time that you you know your chief scientific officer but then you have the whole public health response in low and middle income countries so that's occurring in parallel 
Can the WHO actually facilitate the movement of PPE, oxygen, ventilators around the world, or or can they only or are they somewhat removed from that? How how do how can they assist countries in in obtaining the the um, materials that they need to care for patients? Yeah, that's a good question. In normal times, we we don't do a lot of that uh, logistical work, except in emergency situations. So in Yemen, for example, where we've been really helping the country with the health services because everything there collapsed in the war. So in conflict situations, we do provide those kind of services. Uh, and this time around, we had to because we reached a point where countries were asking for help and they were saying, WHO, you've got to help us. So that's when our emergencies program actually got together with, you know, with the World Food Program, with UNICEF, with the Red Cross, with those agencies that are used to, you know, to doing more of this kind of work, set up a consortium that is now actually doing this work of, uh, of procurement and of uh, delivery to countries that, that ask for it. Uh, this can't be a long-term function. This WHO normally doesn't do that. So we're looking for alternatives, but till then we will continue to do that. But I wanted to mention another function of ours, which is very important, which is the pre-qualification and the emergency use listing. So that's another way we help countries because many countries that don't have very strong regulatory systems of their own or institutions which can you know, assess test kits and so on, rely on WHO's advice. And so when we put out an emergency use listing of a diagnostic test, for example, or a medicine, then countries know that they can go ahead and, and buy those, procure them. And similarly for pre-qualification, um, global agencies like Gavi and UNICEF that procure vaccines will only buy those which are WHO pre-qualified, which is basically a quality assurance okay. uh, certificate. So that's the other way in which we, which is a more routine function for us. Uh, but the emergency procurement is something we had to get into. So, Mia, um, you know, you you know as well as I do. There's, I think I've heard 150 or 190 vaccine candidates. Um, some are moving along quite crisply. I think uh, probably there's a half a dozen to a dozen phase three trials that have been started. China, Russia, the United States, uh, many different uh, countries. Uh, there's very interesting financial relationships, for example, between the U.S. and some companies, U.K. and some companies, Germany and some companies. I'm sure WHO and Gavi are beginning to think about this. Um, you know, a vaccine gets approved uh, late winter, uh, late fall, early winter, early next year. Uh, there's a limited number of doses. How, how is the WHO beginning to grapple with that? I, I'm sure you're trying to think about it now and not when the vaccine is approved. Absolutely. So we did start thinking about this because we've had previous experience in the 2009-10 H1N1 pandemic. It was not a pretty uh, situation because a few high-income countries had basically cornered the market for the vaccines and the drugs. And, and later on agreed to spare some for low-income countries only when the pandemic wasn't as severe as you know could have been. So we don't want to be in that situation now. And, and member states are worried, basically. Countries are asking us to do something. So in April, we launched what's called the ACT Accelerator, which is Access to COVID Technologies Accelerator. It has a diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines uh, pillars. On the vaccine pillar, we're working with Gavi and CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation. And the, and the goal is really twofold. One is to accelerate the development of as many effective and safe vaccines as possible. But the second one is to ensure the equitable and fair access uh, to these vaccines to people who need them all over the world, uh, regardless of their ability to pay. So we... So the idea is you fund the R&D and, and you know, support biotech companies and others so they can process, proceed much faster, invest in advanced manufacturing right. capacity because this is another, you know. Right. You can't approve the uh, vaccine uh, and then start the manufacturing. You'll be another six exactly. months or a year behind. Right? It takes a year. That's yeah. been a big issue when I've talked to various people. 
that the plants are re- up and running, actually. Exactly. So even if you are investing and you're not going to use it ultimately because a vaccine turns out not right. to be the right one, you still have to do it because you save so much time. And then we have what we call the COVAX facility, which will be managed by Gavi. And what it is, is it's a risk pooling and a procurement pooling mechanism. So let's imagine the whole world is divided into two halves. The high income and upper middle income countries are about half the world's population. The lower middle income and low income countries constitute the other half. So let's say, you know, 3.7 billion people each. Now, the idea is that those who can afford to pay the upper income and the uh, high income countries, they actually pay for the vaccine and they pay a little bit of a premium for the speed at which they're going to get it. Um, And so they pay a little bit of upfront money, let's say 15 or 20 percent of what they would pay eventually for their vaccines. And then once the vaccines are in the facility, they can purchase them. And at the same time, for the other half of the world, which is not going to be able to pay, we would have to do it with, you know, overseas development aid funds, the way that Gavi raises funds normally for their other vaccines. We would have to raise several billion dollars to pay for vaccines for those countries. But what's also important is that we are developing in consultation with all our member states a fair allocation framework and a mechanism which basically says okay if we have limited doses of the vaccine let's say we have only 100 or 200 million doses how are we going to distribute this around the world can we say that we would give three percent of the country's population to each country so that they can vaccinate their uh, frontline workers, healthcare workers, the right. ones who are at elderly, most frail risk. elderly, if there's enough doses. And then as you get more doses, you then start vaccinating these other groups, you know, which are more vulnerable. So you go up to 20% of the population and everyone should reach the 20% before you can then distribute the remaining. By the end of 21, 22, probably there will be, you know, larger supplies, let's hope so, especially if we have more than one candidate that's successful. So so the idea is that everyone agrees in this framework that it will not be a situation where one or two countries are vaccinating 100% of their population and and the others are basically just waiting uh, and waiting. And so the risk is that some countries are now doing a lot of bilateral deals and, and it's been called vaccine nationalism. Yeah. Uh, while other countries are saying, hey, you know, let's be fair uh, about this. A um, lot of resources needed. Uh, without doubt, I, I think the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation consistently over the last two decades has provided just an enormous amount of support for Gavi and the World Health Organization. Mm-hmm. Obviously, funding from the U.S. has become problematic because of President Trump's uh, feelings about the WHO at the moment. Um, do you have a sense of how the funding will evolve? Um, is the is the expectation that a number of countries' foundations, particularly the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, will help Gavi and the WHO in terms of procurement and then distribution and administration of the vaccine? This is a massive vac- vaccination program which takes a certain infrastructure. Where where is your sense that the resources yeah. will come from? I'm sure Dr. Tedros is already involved in these discussions, but what's your sense of it? Sumaya. No, absolutely. So Dr. Tidros convened these uh, heads of state, actually. So we had the president of the European Commission and President Macron from France, along with Melinda Gates and Dr. Tedros, who launched this act accelerator on April 24th. And since then, several countries have expressed their interest to join. In fact, at last count, I think we had over 78 countries, high income and upper middle income countries that had expressed an interest in this COVAX facility that Gavi will host, indicating that they would be willing to put funds in. So they have till the end of August, actually. So that's when we will know how many of these countries that expressed interest actually then invest funds uh, in it and walk the talk. But um, obviously, this is going to need a lot of uh, resources. We and we ex- roughly think it would need at least uh, 17, 18 billion dollars between now and the end of 2021 to be able to get 2 billion doses of the vaccine. That's the goal. Okay, so so you have an uh, estimate of 15, 16 billion to get 2 billion doses. Billion yeah. Doses. 
which would be just enough you know to protect this vulnerable group in every country and then of course beyond that because we don't know we think most of the vaccines that are being developed now probably need to two doses yeah that was going to be the next issue is we don't have enough science yet i mean the critical issues there's many efficacy safety but the critical issue is how long is if it's effective how long will it last and how many exactly. doses it's critical because it it has enormous implications for infrastructure and cost yeah and that we have to wait and see the the other thing that we're planning is what we call the solidarity vaccine trial which is basically a, an endeavor to bring again all countries together and say can we accelerate the testing of as many vaccine candidates as possible so that we ensure uh, success because you know the big companies that are developing vaccines they have the wherewithal and the resources to run their own phase 3 trials you know which you need tens of thousands of people but there are many smaller companies and biotechs that are doing this for the first time and have not done this kind of thing at scale so the solidarity vaccine trial which is similar to the solidarity therapeutics trial that that we did and we we have a lot of confidence now having done that would basically work with countries and with sponsors and funders across the world in a sort of partnership in an adaptive trial design where we could keep on bringing on new right. candidates as they become available with some very strict scientific criteria for obviously for you know um stage gating those to see which ones should really go into phase 3 but then put them into these sites around the world where there's high transmission happening so you can answer the efficacy question uh, relatively early so that's again something we are working on with cepi with you know other partners gates foundation has been very much involved in all of this and you know they've been investing in candidates uh, the second generation of vaccine candidates but also in advanced manufacturing capacities and they're also very keen to support clinical trial sites in the developing world africa has developed their own network they have of uh, yes and they want to also be, you know play a leadership role here in not only testing vaccines but also then going into manufacturing and supplying their own populations couple more questions we've been going on but i love chatting with you um sometimes i feel like latin america is the forgotten continent um so much of the focus is on uh, north america Europe and then a Africa. Um, what's been the experience in Latin America? I mean, I'm well aware of what's gone on in Brazil and, and Chile and Argentina, but I, I'm just curious of what your sense about the WHO's relationship with, with Latin America has been. Actually, our, uh, the Pan-American Health Organization, which I mentioned is the regional office for the Americas, North and South. They, play a very important role in Latin America they have very strong relationships with most of the countries and um their challenge of course has been that they also have large uh, populations that are you know that live in poverty that live in i think they have something like 100 million people who live in urban slums in many of the countries they have a lot of migrant workers and labor and um, in some of the countries they've had you know challenges over the last few years which have really uh, weakened their health systems so i think they've they've faced a, a problem like all the other regions have faced where this thing really came in surreptitiously and then sort of exploded uh, particularly in the in the urban areas and it's been uh, testing their public health health system but most of the countries in latin america actually have uh, or many of them have strong social support systems and a very strong public health cadre uh, and a public health system and many of them have invested actually in universal health coverage uh, and also on social protection schemes over the last two decades and so they've been able to really you know gun up their their forces and 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 try to do the best they can but um, it's it's been overwhelming actually for the health systems uh, of many of these countries and essentially again it's it boils down to having enough foot soldiers to do the hard work of you know actually tracking people and testing them and making sure that they're taken care of especially if they are poor and it's it's hard to physically distance because i come from india and i know 
how difficult it is to practice physical distancing in many of our cities, particularly amongst the lower income groups who live in urban slums, who have to share toilets, they have to go and queue up for water facilities. So in large parts of the developing world, you know, it's, it's impractical to advocate physical distancing. And that's why I was very happy this time to come to India and see almost universal masking. Everybody out on the streets is wearing a mask, uh, at least in, in the city of Chennai. And I think it's true in many of the other cities. So things like that. And I think behavior change has happened. I can see that over the last few months in Europe, but I'm also seeing it now in India. And I believe that this behavior change is what is going to see us through the next few months of this pandemic till we actually have enough vaccines. Hopefully we'll have a safe and effective vaccine and, and then vaccinate enough people to break the chains of transmission. When you look back, this is the last question until I have one, one final question. When you look back over the last six months, which since I've read 10,000 papers that have been submitted to JAMA, it's been a long six months, but I've learned a lot. What were the two or three really great successes of the WHO and what were the two or three real challenges that, you know, perhaps you could have done differently? Well, I think, you know, one of the things we've, we're committed to doing is actually looking back and having a review. And we, we've, uh, you might have heard Dr. Tedros has appointed a review committee, which is uh, headed by the ex-president of Liberia, uh, uh, Ellen Sirleaf, and uh, Prime Minister Helen Clark from New Zealand. They're going to head this committee that's going to look at the world's response, WHO's response, but also how did the world respond to the pandemic? So I think that will be a very good learning experience and everyone is going to learn from this. I think our, uh, the way we have approached it is to be, is to work with the data that we have and, and use the data as well as possible and use these networks of scientists and advisors from around the world, uh, get people from every country, every continent, uh, the best experts in th that respective area to advise us so that we are guided by this collective uh, set of uh, huge intellectual power and not just by a few people sitting in Geneva. And we started these health leaders calls and almost on a daily basis, we have calls with, with experts. So I think that's been a huge learning experience for everyone. And it's also made sure that we put out information based on the best available evidence. And I think the other thing I would say was a success is harnessing the scientists. I talked about the research forum mm. we had in February. I think that unanimously everybody agreed that it sort of really helped to focus on, on the important issues and also to kickstart a lot of research the research funders, there were 25 research funders who came to that meeting and put funding into, into some of those projects. Um, we have, I think, made a lot of progress with, with diagnostics, working with other agencies like FIND, you know, on, on pushing innovations, on making sure that we have quality assured tests that we are asking countries to use, and on these standardized protocols. We, we've also made sure that we have these past evidence reviews done. Uh, the one that's coming out soon is in on corticosteroids. I understand it will be in JAMA and that will go hand in hand with our guidelines. And we'd like to do similar things. Whenever we have a guideline, we want to make sure that it's actually based on peer reviewed, solid uh, scientific evidence. We did the same for infection prevention and control. I think the challenge has been the, the rapid pace at which things move mm. and the fact that a lot of it is out in preprints and the media and the public are already talking about things even before we've had time to really see is this really true has it been peer reviewed has it been you know accepted by the scientific community that's the way scientists normally operate but in this case we're being constantly challenged to respond to to stuff that comes out either in news um, uh, in in news report uh, reports or in um, Press, press briefings or in preprints and and then challenge as to why our guidance hasn't been keeping up fast enough. And as I mentioned, a lot of countries really depend on WHO guidance. So it's 
it's a huge responsibility for us. And like I said, we do it based on the available evidence, which is then reviewed by experts. So I think that could be the one challenge that perhaps we can do even better at, which is putting out the guidance uh, even faster than we've, we've done uh, in the past. And, um, but I think this is something that we've all been, you know, learning in this journey together. It's incredible how much you learn every day on immunology, for example. We still don't understand the differences between asymptomatic people right. and those who get really sick right. between children and adults. Right. Even though, yeah, the last week, the reports, you know, where people thought, well, I don't like when people say children because children go from zero to 19 and the 17 yeah. year old is very different than the two year old. So when we finally looked at it by age, it really looks very different between a five year old and a 15 year old. I do have one final question. People who listen to my live streams know I always usually end with more of a personal question. You have a relationship with a very, very famous person, the father of the Green Revolution of India. Could you talk about who that person is? Ah, Howard, you've done some research. I have. So yes, my, my father is um, Dr. M. S. Swaminathan. He's a well-known and a well-respected agricultural scientist who um, ushered in what's what was called the Green Revolution by introducing the high yielding dwarf varieties of wheat right. in Punjab, you know, in the 1960s, working with another very famous agricultural scientist, Dr. Norman Borlaug, uh, an American scientist who then went on to win the Nobel Peace Prize. And the two of them introduced the these dwarf varieties of wheat, which increased production so much that um, India then went from a begging bowl to a bread basket. You know, India was importing food in the 1960s, and we are now in a, in a situation of surplus food. So I think his, his work very early in his life made a huge impact on millions of Indians because he was moved by the mass famines of the 1940s and 50s, and he said he never wants to see a famine again in his life, and that's why he took to agriculture. Um, he's going to be 95 very soon, Howard, and um, he runs his own research foundation. He's been, of course, he's had a long career, including as head of the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines. Um, but his whole life was devoted basically to making sure that science serves society. And that, and then after retirement, he set up the MS Swaminathan Research Foundation in Chennai, which uh, bridges science society and sustainability. Well, very, very few people in the world get to really say they've saved the lives of tens and tens of millions of people. So wish your dad a happy birthday on behalf of JAMA. Um, this is Howard Bachner, editor in chief of JAMA. I, I've been talking uh, to Samaya Swamamathan, who is, um, who is the chief scientific officer of, of the World Health Organization. Um, I, I can't thank you enough. Um, I, I don't think people really appreciate in the United States what the WHO does and its, its extraordinary value to the world. Um, and it, it's, it's really been a, a deep pleasure to talk with you today, Samaya. And please stay healthy and make sure your dad stays healthy at 95. Thank you so much, Howard. It was a pleasure. And I hope you can have more colleagues from WHO speaking with you. I look Thanks forward so to much. it. Bye-bye. Take Thank care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.